Okay. We do product sum. All right. That was the last in that section. Yep. So we're on to our last chapter, chapter six. We were supposed to get all the way to chapter seven, but the ice storm happened and we lost a significant amount. And we lost a whole week. So <clears throat> we're going to have to just go to chapter six. Um, still thinking that we will have your third exam be the highest exam grade you've gotten on your last two midterms. And your final will just be a test you have to take. So, okay. Let's talk about one-to-one -one functions, okay? Okay, abstractly, if you have a domain D and a range R, a function is one to one if for every element in the domain, it maps to one element in the range. This is a one to one function. This one example of a one to one function. Let's call this A. B and C, call this one, two, and three. And if this function is F, it maps the domain onto the range, then it's one to one. And F of, let's say, A is equal to one. F of B is equal to three. And F of C is equal to two. Okay. That's one to one. Here's a function that is not one to one. Say A, B, C. Just like last time, let's say one, two, three. A function that is not one to one would look like this. Let me go here. Let me go here. Here we go here, go here. As you can see, both A and B map to one, all right? So this is not one-to-one. -one. So in words and, and, and mathematics, this is the visual. Uh, we say a function F that maps the domain onto the range is one-to-one -one if, uh, for every uh, let's say uh, x1 and x2 in the domain if f of x1 is equal to f of x2 one to one implies that x1 must be x2. So let's take a look here. It's saying, oh, if the image points, the mapped points are the same, that means if the function is one to one, that means they must have mapped to the same thing in the domain. Notice here, uh, your f of b. So f of b, which is equal to two, and f of b. Oh, let's not use two. Let's use a. f of a, which is equal to one and f of b, which is also equal to one, but it's also equal to two. But notice we're setting up the situation where f of some 
element in the domain is equivalent to another element of the domain. So f of b and f of a equal one. This implies that they equal each other. Right? Because one equals one. But if the function were one to one, that would imply b and a are, are the same thing. But clearly they're not. So the function is not one to one. So this is a contradiction. So why do we care about one to one? Well, if a function is one to one, then you will see that it has many interesting properties. So yeah, here's some examples of graphs. So let's say uh, f of x, which is your y, let's say it equals x. From pre-calc, you guys remember how that graph looks? Here's the x-axis. Here's the y, here's the y-axis. F of x, or y equals x is just a line like this that goes to the origin. Its slope is one, its y-intercept is zero. This indeed is a one-to-one -one function because uh, one gets mapped to one, two gets mapped to two, negative one gets mapped to negative one. Negative two gets mapped to negative two. So this function is indeed one to one. Let's show a function that is not one to one. How about f of x is equal to x squared? We know that this forms a parabola where one, when you square it, it gets mapped to one, and so does negative one. Where two, when you square it, it gets mapped to four, but so does negative two. There's one, there's four, there's negative two. Where three gets mapped to nine, positive nine, but so does negative three. So here, for every point on the y, there's two points that map to it, both the positive and the negative. So this right here is not one to one because the one to one part, the one is in the domain and the other one is in the range. One to one says for every element in the domain, it maps to one element in the range. Why do we care about things being one to one? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, what you guys will realize is that there's the Vertical line test the test for a function, right? That's a function. That's a function, right? The vertical line test is a test for whether you have a function or not. So both of these are clearly functions. But there's another axis test. It's called the horizontal line test. And it tests whether the function has is one to one. So a horizontal line test. So this function y equals x passes the horizontal line test. 
and it shows that it's one-to-one. -one. Vertical line test tells you whether it's a function or not. The horizontal line test tells you, is it one-to-one? -one? Notice that this function does, does not pass the vertical or the horizontal line test. So although it is indeed a function, it is not a one-to-one -one function. So in words, remember, one, so function f, if it, if it maps uh, some x to some y, remember, is one to one if for every for every x1 and x2, let's say numbers and x that if, here's the condition, if f of x1 equals f of x2, this implies that x1 must be x2. Let's use that definition to prove that this parabola x squared is not one-to-one. -one. So notice, we notice that let's say f of three equals f of negative three, does it not? Because they both equal nine. Is that not so? Can we agree on the fact that f of three and f of negative three both equal nine? That, that's because this is equal to positive three squared. And that's because this is equal to negative three squared. So they both equal nine. If the function were one to one, this thing, if this, then it implies that x1 should equal x2 if it is one to one. So I'll write implication question mark. Does that imply three is equal to negative three? Does three equal negative three? No, it doesn't. So we have shown that the function is not one to one. Because if it were one to one, then three should equal negative three, but it doesn't. And so it is not one to one. And the horizontal line test gives you that for free. The horizontal line test is visually what this definition of one to one is saying. Good. All right. So let's identify whether functions are one to one or not. All right, let me draw a function. One-to-one -one or not? It's not one-to-one. -one. Why do you say that? Because you put a horizontal line for you. It does what? Okay. Through it right. How many times can it go through it and 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 be okay? Once. once. Go through <laughs> it once and be okay. But it's going through it multiple times, especially for that line. If I draw the line like this, it will go through it even more. You know. So it is not one to one. What about this function? It's not a function because boom and boom, but is it one-to-one? -one? Not even that, boom and boom. So remember, it's a one-to-one, -one, we talk about one-to-one -one functions. If the graph is not a function, how can it be a one-to-one -one function, right? 
So definitely this is not even a function. And so it can't even be a one-to-one -one function. <laughs> Okay, that's pretty simple enough. Now let's talk about inverse functions and ordered pairs. You guys remember how to find inverse functions from pre-calc? That's okay, I'll refresh your memory. Okay. Uh, you guys remember function composition? Remember what it means to say F composed with G of X? F composed with G of X <laughs> is the same thing as F of G of X, oh, right? And G composed with F of X was the same thing as saying G of F of X. What's the difference between these guys? Well, it's the order of composition. What is composition? Well, I guess that is best explained through an example. For instance, let's say that f of x is equal to 2x squared. Let's say that g of x is equal to the square root of x minus 1. Let's compute f composed with g of x. f composed with g of x. <coughs> It looks like fog, but it's F composed with the G of X. As, as we've noted, the F is on the outside, G is on the inside. How I like to explain this to my pre-calc students is with turkeys and stuffing, like on Thanksgiving. The stuffing goes into the turkey. And right here, <laughs> F composed with G, G is the stuffing and F is the turkey. Whereas G composed with F, F becomes the stuffing and G is the turkey. So you'll see that the order matters. When one behaves like the stuffing versus the turkey, the overall result will be different sometimes. We're interested in when is the overall not different. And we'll get to that. But first, let me exhibit what F composed with G of X is. We replace the stuffing with what we've defined it is. G is just the square root of X minus one. So F composed with G of X is the same thing as F of square root of X minus one. But F of square root of X minus one is I get my turkey ready. I carve out where the stuffing's supposed to go meaning I put some parentheses where every, where, where every X that I see, and I put the stuffing in there. The stuffing is square root of X minus one. So notice that when you take the square root and square that, the root goes away. So all that remains is this two multiplied times the quantity, X minus one. And when you distribute the two through it, you get two X minus two. Aha. But what is G composed with F of X? That's equal to G of F of X. Now the roles have been reversed. F is now the stuffing and G is the turkey. So what does that imply? Well, we have G of what was our F of X? It's that two X squared. So now we've got the stuffing ready. Now let's carve out the turkey in, in preparation for putting the stuffing in. So the turkey is G. I go find my turkey. Okay, there it is. Square root, and I carve out the spot where I'm going to put the stuffing in. You guys hungry yet? Thanksgiving's coming up pretty soon, right? I always use this analogy, whether it's the fall semester or the spring semester, but it, but it really hits home during fall semesters. Okay, so I've got the turkey ready. It's about to get the stuffing in it. What is our stuffing? It's that 2x squared. So I put it in there, and now what? Well, well, you're done because there's nothing else you could do. Notice that this just equals square root of 2x 
squared minus one. There's no more simplification after that. Notice that the order of composition drastically changed the way that the functions looked when you compose them with each other. This is F composed with G of X. This is G composed with F of X. So they don't always equal each other, but we are interested in when they do. And that is when an inverse function comes into play. For a function f of x, we say f inverse of x is an, an inverse function if, and here's the catch. If F inverse, ooh, wow. If, M, if F inverse uh, composed with F of X is equal to F composed with F inverse of X, which equals just X, then mutually both should equal X. Only when this holds do you have an inverse function. So what do we mean by this? Well, let's take the following example. Let's take our beloved f of x is equal to our parabola. We love parabolas in math. f of x is equal to x squared. Uh, and let's take uh, f inverse to be the square root of x. Notice that f composed with f inverse of x is then equal to f of f inverse of x. All right. So now we got to prepare the stuffing. So the way you prepare the stuffing is you just rewrite this and put what f inverse of x is defined as. It's defined as being the square root of x. Done. We've chopped up the stuff and got the cranberry sauce ready and all of that. And now it's ready. So now we're going to place the turkey. Here's our turkey. We're ready to put the stuffing in it. And once we do that, we put the stuffing in it, which is the square root of x. Notice that the square root of x squared ends up equaling x. Aha. So one of the equations holds. Does the other one hold? Well, the other one would be F inverse composed with F of X, but that's F inverse of F of X. Oh, but that's F inverse of, what is our F of X, X squared? Oh, but what is that? Let's prepare, the stuffing is now X squared. Let's prepare the turkey, which is square root of X. I got that turkey ready. And now we insert the stuffing in that location where every time we see an X, that's where the stuffing goes. So then I put an X squared. But without the parentheses distracting you, really this is just the square root of X squared. And we know that that equals technically plus or minus X, but we'll take the positive. Let's say it's the principal square root. So notice that you get X for both, whether you do F composed, F, F composed with F inverse of X or F composed or uh, F inverse composed with F of X. All right. So that's when you know you have an inverse function. And that's an example of an inverse function. So how do we find an inverse function? I just gave you one for free. How do we determine an inverse function? So let's show you, um, clear up some more real estate here. How 
how do you do this? Well, for instance, let's say we have a function f of x is equal to uh, the square root of 2x minus 1 all divided by 3. What's f inverse of x? <coughs> Here's how you do it. Well, you say your f of x is the same thing as a y, right? So in the step-by-step -step algorithm, step one is to switch the variables x and y. Every time you see an x, convert it to a y. Every time you see a y, convert it to an x. So this becomes, then, if we do that, 2y minus 1, everything divided by 3, is equal to x. Does it not? <clears throat> right? So once you do that, step 2 is now solve for y. So to solve for y, we have to multiply both sides by 3 here. So I get 3x is equal to the square root of 2y minus 1. And I really want to know what y is, so I first must remove that radical. So we square both sides to remove the radical. So then I get th uh, 3x quantity squared is equal to what's inside the radical, 2y minus 1. We then notice that 3x quantity squared is the same thing as 9x squared, right? And then we can add a 1 to both sides so of the equation. So I get 2y is equal to 9x <coughs> squared plus 1. And then to solve for y, all I got to do is divide both sides by 2. Bring the calculation up here. Then we get our y, which I will claim is now our f inverse of x, is going to equal 9x squared plus 1 divided by 2. How do we prove that this is the bona fide inverse function to the function? Because this is what our calculation results in. How do we prove that this is the true inverse function? We show that it satisfies the definition of an inverse function. So what we got to show is that F inverse of f of x is the same thing as f of f inverse of x. And they should both mutually equal x. This is what we got to show. f inverse of f of x. Here, the turkey is f inverse, and the stuffing is f. So what we do is we prepare the stuffing by putting what f of x is in here, and that's square root of 2x minus 1 all over 3. Now we prepare the turkey. Where is our turkey? It's that uh, f inverse. So every time I see an x, I'm going to carve it out. So I got a 9, carve it out, put the square there plus one, everything divided by two. Now that the turkey's ready, we will insert the stuffing into it. Square root, two x minus one, everything divided by three. Hopefully we get this all to equal <coughs> x. If it doesn't, then that's bad. That means we don't have an inverse function. That means we've been an error in this calculation. But let's see. When you square this quantity, the square distributes to the numerator and the denominator. When it hits the numerator, all you get is that 2x minus 1. When it hits the denominator, it squares it, and that becomes a 9. 
Okay, so this is what we get then. Notice that the nines cancel here because this is really nine over one. The nines cancel. So we get two X minus one plus one over two. Notice that minus one plus one cancel. So we get two X over two. Notice that the twos then cancel and we just get X. So F inverse of F of X does equal X, but so this one is check. Check, but we now need to check this one. That better also equal X or else it's not a bona fide inverse function. F of F inverse of X is like so. Now the stuffing is F inverse. So let's prepare the stuffing. We write what that is, 9X squared plus one all over two. And now we prepare our turkey for the stuffing. Our turkey is F of X. So when I write F of X, Every time I see an X, I'll carve out a region in preparation for the stuffing. Then I say, well, what is the stuffing? It's this right here. So I put it in there. So it's nine X squared plus one all over two. Maybe I should have been color coding that the whole time when I do that. Okay, but notice what happens when we do this. We get that this is the square root and the twos cancel. So this becomes nine X squared plus one minus one, everything divided by three. The plus one and the minus one cancel. So what we end up getting is that the numerator becomes the square root of nine X squared and the denominator is just your three. Notice that the square root distributes to both these terms, square root of nine, square root of x squared, all over three. And that this ends up becoming three x over three. And the threes cancel, so you just get x. So, aha, boom. So it is indeed the bona fide inverse function. Let's do another example. Now that you know, now that I've walked you through the process once, we're just gonna do it again. Let's say f of x is equal to uh, x over 2x minus 1. What is f inverse of x? Oh, actually, I don't want to put an x here. Let's just put a 3 here. Step one, set it equal to a Y. Step two, flip every variable. Every time you see an X, convert it to a Y. Every time you see a Y, convert it to an X. Now, solve for y. So in order to do so, what we do is we multiply both sides here by this denominator. And we get 3 is equal to the quantity 2y minus 1 times x. Okay. 
Then we divide both sides by x. That implies I get 3 all over x is equal to 2y minus 1. Then we add 1 to both sides. That means 3 over x plus 1 is equal to 2y. Divide both sides by a 2. And that implies we get 3 over x plus 1 all over 2 is equal to our y, which is our f inverse of x. So we believe f inverse of x is this 3 over x plus 1, everything over 2. We believe that this is what it is, but we must prove that it is. So let's do so. <clears throat> f of f inverse of x is better equal x. So let's prepare the stuffing, which is 3 over x plus 1 all over 2. Now that the stuffing is prepared, let's prepare the turkey. Every time I see an X, I'm going to carve out some a region of that tur turkey to stick the stuffing in. Okay, so then we get uh, two times what's in there. There's three over X plus one, everything divided by two minus a one. I just put a, a big hole here and then place what the stuffing is. And this tells you what it is. So then we do algebra. The numerator is just a, a three. Some stuff is going on in this denominator here. Notice that the twos cancel. So all that we're left with is a three over X plus a one minus a one. The one and minus one cancel. So we get three divided by three over X. But when you multiply by reciprocals, three is really technically three over one. And when you multiply by reciprocals, I get X over three over here. And so the threes cancel, and what we reduce to is just x. Good. So far, so good. I mean, so good so far. This is what happens when you use two hands. Start to flip idiomatic expressions in your head. Is it, It's so far, so good. Mm -hmm. Hello. So good so far. <laughs> no one says that, except kooky people like me. <clears throat> so now we also have to show the f inverse of f of f of x is also equal to x. Let's see whether it is or not. If it is not, then we messed up. So f of x is now the stuffing. Let's prepare the turkey for the stuffing. What is f of x? It's that. 3 over 2x minus 1. Okay, we prepared the stuffing. Now it's time to carve out the turkey. Where is this turkey at? It's f inverse of x, right? And we postulate that that's what that is in that yellow. So every time I see an x, I'll just leave a slot ready for that stuffing. So the yellow goes in there. So this goes 3. Boom. Then I just do algebra. Multiplying by reciprocals. This is really 3 over 1 times the reciprocal of that. Plus your 1, everything divided by 2. Notice that the threes cancel. So 
bring the calculation over here. Threes cancel, so what I'm left with is a 2x minus a 1 plus a 1, everything divided by 2. Minus 1 and plus 1 cancel, so I got 2x over 2. These cancel, so I just have x. Aha! It is indeed a bona fide inverse function because it didn't matter. The order of function composition did not matter. We were able to restore it to the value of x every time we composed it with itself. This has beautiful geometrical consequences. Notice that this is the function for square root of x. And if you just take the positive portion, this is the function for x squared. Of course, it has this part too, but we don't take that part because it wouldn't be one to one anymore. So what we could do is restrict the domain of x squared to just be for the positive values. Then it looks like that. Notice that those two are function and inverse function pairs. So what is beautiful is that every time you have this geometrically, you get this beautiful line of symmetry every time that there is a function and inverse function pair. There's this beautiful symmetrical phenomenon that goes on each time. It's as if the function and the inverse function are mirror images of, of, the, of themselves. They truly look like a reflection about that axis of symmetry. You guys see that? It's like square root of x is looking at itself in a mirror, and that orange line is the mirror. So it has reflectional symmetry about the orange axis, which is really cool that inverse functions and functions do this. This is the geometrical significance of the algebra. The cool thing is algebra and geometry are intimately related, as you can see here. So what does that mean? That means numbers and shapes are really barking up the same tree. What does that mean? Well, if our physical reality is composed of things that we can quantify using shapes, which we do all the time, look at the bricks back there, they're rectangles. Look at the boards here, they're rectangles. Look at the chairs there, they're, they're squares. Look at, the, look at the clock, it's a circle. Everything can be turned into a shape for the most part, even the most irregular objects. Like an irregular object, oh, it's a blob. Well, it's a blob, but if you zoom in enough, this kind of looks like a triangle. If you cut it off like this, this kind of looks like half of a circle. If you do this and then chop it up like that, well, that kind of looks like two triangles. We can actually turn all real life objects into quantifiable discrete mathematical objects via approximations. And we can make our approximations as accurate as possible by, by zooming in farther and farther and farther. So what human beings are able to do is utilize math to quantify reality, which is pretty cool. I don't see iguanas doing that. I don't see turtles and maybe dolphins. Dolphins are pretty smart, but I don't see dolphins doing it either. I don't see Humboldt squid doing it. They might be doing it in their heads, who knows? But human beings are pretty special in the fact that we can do this with our minds. And truly, we must rejoice in that fact. And that's why I like math so much. Because we are all composed of atoms, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, hydrogen. Throw some sodium in there, potassium, plenty of them. A lot, of, where's the periodic table of elements when you need it? A lot of them. We're composed of those elements, but so is this table. It's composed of those similar elements. And so is that ground, and so is that backpack, and so is this book. It's constructed by the same atoms that construct you and me. And yet we can, we can ponder and contemplate our own existence. Pretty, pretty darn cool.
Think about that when, you know, you're feeling down or something like that. Think about the fact that you have the ability to do that and what a special gift it is. It's truly remarkable. Okay. So let's say we have a function that's not one-to-one. -one. Can we convert it to a one-to-one -one function? We already discussed this. Actually, we already discussed it here. Notice that f of x is equal to x squared. Although it may be a function, it passes the vertical line test. Passes the vertical line test. OK, it's a function. It is clearly not a uh, inverse function, right? Because it fails the horizontal line test. But that's why I had said, OK, restrict the domain. Because restricting the domain, like so, and now that horizontal line test passes. Because usually f of x is equal to x squared can, its domain is all real numbers. So we can plug in any real number and it'll spit out a valid answer. But it's not a one-to-one -one function, but we can convert it to a one-to-one -one function if we say that take x squared and so f a function maps real to the reals, all reals to all reals, such that f of x x squared. This is a function, but it is not one to one. We can convert it by restricting the domain by saying let it map. all real numbers. And a matter of fact, matter of fact, we can just go ahead and include that zero point off. Now, not only is it a function, check, it is also one to one, check. So let's do one more practice round and then actually uh, graph them both. Let's do f of x is equal to, let's say uh, 2x minus one. What is f inverse of x? And once you find it, graph both. So here's part A, what's the inverse? Part B, graph both. And really subtly in part A, you have to prove that you found the inverse function. Not only do you find f inverse, you prove that it is the inverse function. Or else you haven't found f inverse yet. You can notationally say, oh, well, this is f inverse, but if it doesn't satisfy the definition, then you are mathematically lying. So the way we find f inverse, how do we do it? Well, we get our function f of x. We set that equal to y. Remember, then you flip. Every time you see a y, you turn it to an x. Every time you see an x, you turn it to a y. And then you algebraically solve for y. So we add a one to both sides. Divide by two.
And this is the F inverse that we get. We must prove that it is, in, that it is indeed F inverse. So what we'll do is we'll take F inverse of F of X. Let's see what that gives us. F of X is the, tur is the stuffing and F inverse is the turkey. So we'll prepare the stuffing. We'll put it here, two X minus one. And now we'll prepare to the turkey. The turkey is this So we're going to put that stuffing right there. So then the parentheses don't even have to be there. I know what you're thinking. When can parentheses and when can't they just disappear like that? Well, there's nothing being multiplied or divided by the 2x minus 1. So that's why we can just remove the parentheses. Parentheses are there to ensure that when we multiply and divide, we do it to both pieces, not just one. That's why we can just disintegrate the parentheses, because it really doesn't matter. Because technically, it's just multiplied times one, and you can distribute the one, and nothing changes. Then we can cancel out this minus one and this plus one. And what we end up getting is 2x over 2. And you know what that equals. Now let's see if uh, f of f inverse of x is also equal to x. So now the stuffing is f inverse. So I'll prepare our f inverse, which we say is that x plus 1 over 2. There's our stuffing. Our turkey is f of x. And let's prepare the turkey. I got the turkey ready. I got the stuffing ready. Time to put it to work here. All right. Then the twos cancel. So all I get is x plus 1 minus 1, which is x. OK, OK. We got it. We found f inverse of x. It is indeed this x plus 1 over 2. Part A is complete. Time for part B, graph them. How do we graph anything in math? Hmm? Plug it in. OK. Plug what in? Yeah, so you mean plug in various inputs and tabulate what the outputs are? What would you kind of store this information in? Table. Table. Yes. Very good, Travis. What we want to do is we want to store this information in a f of x, x table. It is quite the useful tool for um, documenting the results, if you will, and being able to formulate a graph. So let's pick some symmetrical values about the origin. Negative two, negative one, zero, two, one. And now let's compute and then tabulate our results for those various inputs. F of uh, negative two. So first we're going to uh, graph F of X. F of negative two is when I replace every X with a negative two. Here, technically, the stuffing is negative two and the turkey is 2x minus one. Okay. All right. So then what you get is a negative four minus a one, which is a negative five. And we just put it in the table. What is f of negative one? Well, that's just two times negative one minus one. But that's just negative two minus one, which is a negative three. OK. 
We already know we got a graph both. We already know what f of x is. The only thing that we need to keep up with there is what f inverse of x is. Then what is f of zero? Well, that's just two times zero. Minus one, that's just minus one. We put it in our table. What is f of one? Well, that's just two times one minus one, which is uh, two minus one, which is one. We put it in our table. What is f of two? That's two times two minus one. That's four minus one. It's three. Put a three. All right. We've tabulated it for several results. For several inputs, we found various outputs. So let's see what the graph looks like. Here's x. Here's y. Here's negative two, negative one, one, two. I go to negative two, I find a negative five. One, two, three, four, five. I go to negative two on the x, I find a negative five on the y, and I put a dot. I go to negative one, I find a negative three, I put a dot. I go to zero, I find a negative one, so I put a dot. I go to one, Yeah. <laughs> I go to one, I find a one, and I put a dot. I go to two, I find a three, I put a dot. Then we connect these dots here. Our function is linear, so it's to no surprise that it looks like a straight line. And here's our f of x. What does f inverse of x look like? Well, we got to create a table for it too and do the same thing so we can plot it. So we got to create an f inverse of x, x table. We'll pick some inputs, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. So let's play this game. What's f of negative, what's f inverse of negative two? Well, that's just negative two plus one all over two, which is a negative one half. What's f inverse? Negative one. This is negative negative one plus one all over two. This is zero all over two. Zero. What is f inverse of zero? That's just zero plus one all over two. So that's just one over two, which is a half. What is F? What is F inverse of one? Oh, well, that's just one plus one all over two, which is two over two, which is the one. What is F inverse of two? Oh. That's just two plus one all over two, 
which is three halves. Well, let's plot it. And let's plot it on our same plot so that we can see the difference. I go to negative two. I find a negative one half and I put a dot. I'm just gonna move this negative two here to up here. I go to negative two, I find a negative one half and I put a dot. I go to negative one, I find a zero, I put a dot. I go to zero, I find a one half, I put a dot. I go to one and I find a one and I put a dot. I go to two and I find a three halves. I go to two, I find a three halves, which is like 1.5, right? And I put a dot. Notice what's happening here when you connect the dots. It's exactly as I noted before, that there's this internal symmetry about an axis. So it's as if the yellow is looking at the orange in a mirror. Or it's like it's looking at itself in a very still pond. Okay. And that's that. You guys have been very good today. <laughs>